Genesis chapter 41 this morning. Genesis chapter 41, I am glad there is nothing in this world greater than the grace of Jesus. I'm glad His grace will see us through anything. Before we begin our message this morning, I want to kind of lay the foundation uh, and point something out this morning before we get started, uh, that in our Bibles from Genesis to Malachi is separated from uh, Matthew to Revelation. Our uh, Bible is separated into two different books, the Old Testament books and the New Testament books. The New Testament books begin during the ministry and the life of Jesus Christ. Uh, it is the day of grace is what it is called. Uh, we're still living in the, the, the day of grace. We're still living in that same age. And I'm thankful that we live in the day of grace. So many people discount and want to take out the books from Genesis to Malachi. But what are so beautiful about the, the books from Genesis to Malachi is it draws a picture of things to come. And everything that we see in the New Testament was drawn out way before it ever happened. And what is so beautiful about that is it proves the power and the plans of God. It proves how great He is because everything before He ever did it, He, he used prophets, He used uh, the tabernacle, He used pictures, He used things to draw our minds and to pull us to the New Testament. And basically in the Old Testament, everything He did was to point to the New Testament. And so everybody in the Old Testament, people often say, how did they get saved? Their faith was in the things to come. You see, our faith is in something that already took place in the New Testament. And so everything in the Old Testament is to point a picture specifically to Jesus Christ. The tabernacle to Solomon, we can go on down the road. God was trying to draw pictures of Jesus so that when Jesus came to the world, this whole world was seen for who he was. This whole world was seen for who he is. And so many people missed out and they didn't see him for who he was. They knew the scripture, but they never would see him for who he was. I want you to know that I can take every book of the book of the Old Testament. I can preach to you the most beautiful message of Jesus Christ. He's all in this, friend. He is all in this. Genesis chapter 41, if you would stand with me. I want you to keep that in mind. This is a picture of things to come. I want us to look at a man that God used to draw a picture of things to come. If you were in vacation Bible school, you ought to be familiar with some of this on the life of Joseph. Genesis 41 and verse 45. And Pharaoh called Joseph's name zephnath Paneah, and he gave him to wife Asenath, the daughter of Potiphar, priest of On. And Joseph went out over all the land of Egypt. In this verse, we see that Joseph is made a ruler over Egypt. The next seven years, Egypt is fixing to have seven years of bountiful plentiness through all of the harvest, through all of the crops. They're fixing to have a harvest like they've never had before. Okay, And after this seven years, there will be a seven-year drought upon the face of the earth. And we get to verse 53. And the seven years of plentiness that was in the land of Egypt were ended. And the seven years of dearth began to come, according as Joseph had said. And the dearth was in all lands, but in all the land of Egypt there was bread. And when all the land of Egypt was famished, the people cried to Pharaoh for bread. And Pharaoh said unto all the Egyptians, Go unto Joseph, what he saith to you, do. And the famine was over all the face of the earth. And Joseph opened all the storehouses and sold unto the Egyptians. And the famine waxed sore in the land of Egypt. Now listen to this. And all countries came unto Egypt to Joseph for to buy corn because that the famine was so sore in all the lands. Dear Heavenly Father, thank you for the reading of this scripture today. Open our minds. Open our hearts. Give us understanding, Lord. I need your help. I need your touch this morning. Lord, I want to be filled with your Holy Spirit as I preach this message. Lord, I want, to, I want this message to be from you. Lord, I don't want to mess up what you made so holy and so right. Lord, protect your word this morning. 
Lord, I pray you put a hedge about it, put a hedge about this place. And Lord, I pray that souls will be saved. Thank you, Lord, for drawing so many pictures of what the truth is. Every age, every generation could see who the Savior of the world is. Through your Bible, through your power, through your authority, Lord, there will be no excuse when mankind stands before you. Lord, we know through your word and through your power that Jesus is the Savior of the world. Thank you, Lord for so many times showing us over and over again that Jesus is above all. Lord, I'm going to lift him up today. And Lord, as I do that, I pray you draw all men unto you. Lord, I thank you and I praise you. In Jesus' name I pray, amen. You may be seated. I want to talk to you this morning on the subject, Joseph, the Old Testament Savior. Joseph, the Old Testament Savior. Now, I mentioned this morning that in the Old Testament, God took these Old Testament stories to draw a, a picture to the New Testament so that people could see these things in the Old Testament to know what God was going to do in the New Testament. Now, there were many things to illustrate Jesus in the Old Testament. Uh, through the tabernacle, through the temple, every piece of furniture, every piece of covering, everything that was done in those two buildings was a picture of Jesus Christ and how that he was going to be the Savior of the world. I'll tell you, a man that was used in the Old Testament to draw a picture of Christ was Solomon. King Solomon was one of the greatest kings with the most riches that any man has ever had upon the face of the earth. And the Bible said in the New Testament that there was one greater than Solomon. That, that is a picture of the success of Jesus Christ. And there's many pictures that we have in the Old Testament to point to Jesus. To me, one of the most beautiful pictures of Jesus Christ is found in the story that we read of today. It is found in the life of Joseph. And I'm going to ask for everybody's attention this morning. I want everybody all eyes up here. I want all focus on the Word of God because I've got a lot of things to go through this morning, but I want to take the life of Joseph, and I want to look at his life, and I want to draw a picture of his life and compare it to the life of Jesus Christ. And I want to see how Joseph, the Old Testament Savior, is a picture of Jesus, the Savior of the world. Are y'all with me this morning? I want you to look in your Bibles here, and I want to start at the beginning of this story, and I want to look in Genesis chapter 37. And I'm going to ask for all attention. I want you to stay with me. Keep flipping in your Bibles with me. Genesis chapter 37. And the first thing that I want us to notice about the life of Joseph is, number one, he was loved by his father. He was loved by his father in Genesis 37. And in verse 3, the Bible said, Now Israel, which is Jacob, loved Joseph more than all of his children because he was the son of his old age and made him a coat of many colors. I want you to know that this man had many sons, but the last born, Joseph, was his favorite. He loved his son. He had great love. He had a great relationship with him to the point that he took this coat of many colors, which is a picture of the glory of Jacob, and he put it upon his son. I want you to know when we look at the life of Joseph that Joseph is loved by his father. And he's loved by his father to the point and to the place that the father was willing to put all of his glory that he had and all of his power and all the authority of his kingdom upon his son. And that's what Jacob did for Joseph. Now I want you to look over. Chapter 37 and verse 23. I want you to notice that he had on this coat of many colors. I want you to notice that he carried the glory of his father. But I want you to notice this in verse 23. And it came to pass when Joseph was coming to his brethren that they stripped Joseph out of his coat, his coat of many colors that was on him. When his brethren, when his brothers seen him, they were jealous of the glory of the Father because the Father loved that Son so much that He put all of His glory upon Him. And when the brothers looked at Him, they were jealous. They were outraged. And so they took the glory of Joseph and they stripped Him of His glory. They took away the glory that He had. They took away the glory that He had of His Father. And everything the 
the Father laid upon the Son, I want you to know that His brother stripped Him of that very glory. I want you to notice in verse 28. I want you to notice verse 20 what? 28, if you're with me, say amen. amen. Verse 28 then there passed by Midianites, merchant men, and they drew and lifted up Joseph out of the pit and sold Joseph to the Ishmaelites for 20 pieces of silver, and they brought Joseph into Egypt. So we find Joseph is loved by his father. We find that he is stripped of his glory, and now he becomes a slave. He is sold into slavery. Now listen to this. This is a young man that had all authority and all power and dominion over the kingdom of his father. His brethren was jealous of him, so they stripped him of that glory. And now he goes from the palace to this pit, and he becomes a slave to mankind. He becomes a servant to mankind. He was lifted up upon the house. He was above all in that kingdom. And now he was stripped of his glory, and now he's sold into slavery. Boy, what a change in his life. That he was up above all, then he is stripped of his glory, and now he is a servant and a slave of the people. Now I want you to look over in Genesis chapter 39. And the life of Joseph continues. The life of a slave continues. And he goes here, there, and yonder. And I want to pick up here in chapter 39 in verse 2. And the Lord was with Joseph, and he was a prosperous man, and was in the house of his master the Egyptian. And his master saw that the Lord was with him, and that the Lord made all that he did to prosper in his hand. Boy, what a beautiful verse there. And I love this, that this man became a servant. He became a slave. He was in the lowest of lows, but even in the lowest of lows, God's hand was upon this man. And I want you to know that Joseph was very, very prosperous in his life. And everything that he put his hand upon, God touched and God blessed. Joseph was a prosperous man. He was a servant. He was a slave to mankind. But even through all of that, even through all of the hardships and all of the trials, God's hand was upon this man and he prospered in everything that he did. Did he face trials? Did he face hardships? You better believe it. But even through all of the valleys, God was with this man. And he prospered everywhere he walked. He prospered everywhere he went. Everything that he touched flourished because of the power of God upon this man. I want you to look here in verse 7 of chapter 39. If you're with me, say amen. I want you to notice this. Verse 7, And it came to pass... After these things that his master's wife cast her eyes upon Joseph, and she said, Lie with me. But he refused and said unto his master's wife, Behold, my master wotteth not what is with me in the house, and he hath committed all that he hath to my hand. And so he is in Potiphar's house, and we know in this that he prospered, but in this prosperity, he was faced with temptation. And the temptation of this wife, he came and he, she basically threw herself at him. This man had every opportunity to commit this sin and to commit this adultery, but being the man of God that he was, he overcame the temptation in his life. Teenagers, I want your attention this morning. I want your attention, teenagers. In everything that this man did, he prospered, but he was tempted in every way. And in every way that he was tempted, he overcame every temptation. I want you to know that when you read through the book of Joseph, I know there's not but one sinless man that ever walked upon the face of this, of this earth, and his name is Jesus. But if you go through the life of Joseph, I don't find a lot of sin in this man's life. I'm not saying he's perfect. I'm not saying he's sinless because he wasn't sinless, okay? But God is trying to draw us a picture of things to come. And here's this man that was tempted of sin and this man was so full of God that he overcame the temptation in his life. I want you to notice this in uh, chapter 39 and verse 11. 
And it came to pass about this time that Joseph went into the house to do his business. And there was none of the men of the house there within. And she called him by his garment, saying, Live with me. And he left his garment in her hand and fled and got him out. And it came to pass when she saw that he had left his garment in her hand, he was fled forth, that she called unto the men of her house and spake unto them, saying, See, he hath brought in a Hebrew unto us to mock us. He came in unto me to lie with me, and I cried with a loud voice. I want you to know this man overcame the temptation, but he was wrongly accused. This man didn't do anything wrong, but this woman took this and wrongly accused him. This man is fixing to face something that he didn't deserve to face. He's fixing to receive a punishment that he didn't deserve to receive. I want you to know that this man prospered. This man overcame temptation, but he had to suffer anyway because he was wrongly accused. And then she comes before Potiphar the husband and she brings this offense to him and she wrongly accuses him. And I want you to look down here with me. Still in the uh, 39th chapter. Look here. In verse 19, And it came to pass when his master heard the words of his wife, which he spake unto him, saying, After this manner did thy servant to me, that his wrath was kindled. And Joseph's master took him and put him into the prison, a place where the king's prisoners were bound. He was there in the prison. This man was wrongly accused, but friend, he never offered any defense. I want you to know that he didn't do wrong. But when these accusations fell upon this man, he never offered any defense. If I was this man, I would have been screaming on the top of my lungs, I'm innocent, I'm innocent, I didn't do any of this. But friend, he offered no defense. I want you to notice this in verse 20. In verse 21, But the Lord was with Joseph and showed him mercy, and gave him favor in the sight of the keeper of the prison. This man was sent to prison. He offered no defense, and he suffered as an innocent man. But I want you to know he was innocent. I want you to know that he didn't do anything wrong. Mankind was on him. Mankind was stripping him of his glory. Mankind was treating him as a slave and a servant. They wrongly accused him. And I want you to know that God never left this man's side. God's hand was steady upon him, and he never left him. And so Joseph was sent to the prison. Now I want you to go back to chapter 41. Chapter 41, and we go to where we began In verse 45, from the prison, God takes this man to the palace. In verse 45, and Pharaoh called Joseph's name, Zaphnath Paneah. And I want you to think about that name, and then we go to the scriptures that we read earlier, that basically he became the king of Egypt. This man was wrongly accused. This man offered no defense. He suffered as an innocent man, and God blessed him. God raised him up. God exalted him. May I remind you, Joseph was a Hebrew man, and he raised him up upon the house of Pharaoh. And in this, he made him a great ruler. There was a famine upon the land. I want you to know for seven years there was great prosperity and in the seven years Joseph stored up all of these goods and all of these goods he stored up for seven years. The next seven years became a famine in all of the world. And the Bible says that all of Egypt, all of Israel, all of every country around was fed and was filled by what was going on in Egypt. I I want you to know this morning that in that day if you wanted your family to be fed and filled you had to go to Joseph. If you wanted substance in your life, you had to go to Joseph. This man was in prison. This man was in a pit. But God raised him up and gave him a kingdom to be Savior over. And I want you to know that he became the Savior of many families. He became the Savior of many countries because there wasn't a family, there was not a country that could eat and be filled without going before Joseph. And I want you to know this man suffered a lot, but God highly exalted him. And I want you to know he gave him a position and everybody in the world if they wanted to be saved were going to have to submit themselves to Joseph the Old Testament Savior. But as I have gone through this story today may we take the story of Joseph and may we apply it to another man. I want 
I did not come here this morning to tell you just about a man named Joseph. I came here this morning to tell you about a man named Jesus. I want you to know as I look at Joseph and I see the life of Joseph, friend, it's a picture of Jesus Christ. It is a picture of things to come. I want us to look, and Brother Lance is going to put all the Scripture on the screen for us this morning, and I want you to stay with me. And I want us to go through this, and we're going to be dismissed after this. But I want to compare the life of Joseph to the life of Jesus. We began with Joseph being loved by his father in the book of Hebrews. The book of Hebrews chapter 1. I want you to notice this and you can follow along on the screen with me. And I'll read this verse to you. In verse 2 and verse 3, Hath in these last days spoken unto us by his Son, whom he hath appointed heir of all things, by whom also he made the worlds, who being the brightness of his glory and the express image of his person, and upholding all things by the word of his power, when he had by himself purged our sins, sat down on the right hand of the majesty on high. As Joseph was loved by his father, may I tell you, there has never never been a love relationship between a father and son like God the Father and Jesus Christ. I guarantee you that God the Father loved his son more than Jacob ever loved Joseph. And I want you to know that God loved Jesus so much that he put his brightness into Jesus. He put his express image into Jesus. He put his glory on Jesus. And all the glory that Joseph, that Jacob had, he put upon Joseph. I want you to know that God put everything he had in Jesus. Jesus is the fullness of the Godhead bodily. Everything that is in Jesus came from the Father and everything the Father had, He put it all on Jesus. I want you to know that the Father loves the Son. And if you look there with me in 2 Corinthians chapter 8, 2 Corinthians chapter 8 and verse 9, the Bible says, For you know the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, that though He was rich, yet for your sakes He became poor, that ye through His poverty might be rich. As this man, Joseph, had all the glory of his father, his brethren stripped him of that glory. I want you to know there was a day that Jesus sat in glory land with all the glory of God sitting upon Him. And there was a day that His glory was taken from Him so that He could take upon himself the robes of humanity and come be the savior of the world. Notice what the Bible says. Yet for your sakes he became poor. Yet for your sakes he became poor. Jesus was stripped of his glory. I want you to know no man took the glory of Jesus Christ, but Jesus Christ laid down his glory. He set it aside for a short time so that he could take upon himself humanity and become the Savior of the world. Here is Jesus who was loved by the Father that had all the glory of the Father and now He is stripped of that glory. If you'll notice Philippians chapter 2 and verse 7, but made Himself of no reputation, took upon Him the form of a servant and was made in the likeness of man. I want you to know that when He was stripped of His glory, He became a slave. As Joseph became a slave, Jesus became a slave. The Bible said he took upon himself the form of a servant. The Greek word servant means slave. Jesus became a slave. He came to serve. I want you to know that when Jesus came to this world, he is the leader and ruler of all. But he set that to the side for, for a little while to become a servant and a slave. And in this, he was obedient to the will of God. He became a servant and a slave to the will of God and he became a servant and a slave to the needs of humanity. I want you to know that he became a servant of me. He became a servant of you. Teenagers, I want y'all this morning. I want y'all's attention this morning, please. Please. And I want you to know that Jesus came and he became a servant and a slave to the, to the needs of the Father and he became a servant and a slave to the needs of humanity. And everything that Jesus did, he did because he was a servant. But I want you to notice in Mark 7 verse 37, the Bible said, and we're beyond measure... Now, Jesus was just healing people here. It says, And we're beyond measure astonished, saying, He hath done all things well. 
He maketh both the deaf to hear and the dumb to speak. As Joseph was a prosperous man, may I tell you that Jesus was a prosperous man. No man lived like Jesus lived. Are you with me this morning? I want you to know that nobody lived a life quite like Jesus did. Everywhere he went, he made an impact. Everywhere he went, he made a difference. He healed. He caused people to stand up that's never stood. He caused people to speak that never spoke. He caused people to hear that never heard. I want you to know that Jesus changed lives. He was a prosperous man. The hand of the Almighty Father was upon him, and he prospered him in every thing that he did. You want to live life, friend? You want to read about a man who lived life to the fullest? Read the story of Jesus Christ. He lived it like no man has ever lived it. There was prosperity in his hand that nobody else has ever had before. I want you to look at this next one. 1 Peter 2 and 22. The Bible said, who did, who did no sin, neither was guile found in his mouth. As Joseph overcame temptation, may I tell you that my Savior Jesus overcame temptation. I want you to know as Joseph, we don't find in the Bible where he messed up, but friend, he messed up. There was times that he messed up. But when you go to the story of Jesus, there was no sin found upon the life of Jesus Christ. Listen to me. He lived in this world for 30-something years without ever messing up, without ever committing sin. The Bible said, Who did no sin, neither was guile found in his mouth. I want you to know that this man overcame temptation. May I say this? This God-man overcame temptation. He overcame the temptation of the Pharisees, of the Sadducees, of the chief priests. He overcame the temptation of the devil himself. Everything that was thrown at Jesus to make him stumble. Everything that was thrown at him to make him be a sinner. He overcame. He overcame. I'm glad Jesus is an overcomer this morning. I'm glad he overcome every temptation. He overcome every sin that he was ever faced with. But even though he overcame temptation as Joseph, he was wrongly accused. Luke 23 and verse 14 there at the end of the verse says, Having examined him before you, this is Pilate here, I have found no fault in this man. Touching those things whereof ye accuse him, no, nor yet Herod. I want you to know that Jesus was wrongly accused. Jesus went to the cross and he died a death that he did not deserve to die. Listen, Joseph had to, to face persecution. He had to face penalties that he did not deserve to face. Jesus Face something that Jesus did not have to face. He was he 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 didn't do these things. Jesus was perfect. And as Pilate came and all these uh, chief priests came and they accused him, they wrongly accused him. He died a death that he did not did not deserve. I want you to know that he didn't do the things these people laid these charges on. And Pilate even got to the place where I don't see anything wrong that this man had done. Even to the place he said, I'm just going to take him to the people because his blood is not going to be on me. This is an innocent man. I want you to know that Jesus was wrongly accused. The man that we find that died upon the cross was an innocent man. Do you hear me this morning? Is an innocent man, but as Joseph offered no defense, my Savior, Matthew 26 and 63, but Jesus held his peace. He was wrongly accused, but he held his peace. Oh, what a Savior. He was wrongly accused, but he held his peace. He was fixing to die on a cross that was not his, but he held his peace. He was fixing to die death that he was not worthy to die of, but he held his peace. And as Joseph stood before Potter, Potiphar and he kept his mouth closed and he never offered any defense, as Jesus stood there that day before the jury and the judge, he offered no defense. And he went and he died a death. Let me tell you something. Jesus could have pulled himself off that cross. Jesus could have stopped what was going on. Jesus had the power and the ability to come off of that cross. He had the power and ability to destroy those Roman soldiers. He had the power and ability to destroy Pilate and Herod. Friend, I want you to know the Roman soldiers did not kill Jesus. Jesus freely laid down his life for us. He offered no defense. When you look at the cross, would you see an innocent man that died for sinners? When you look at the cross, would you see a man that's never done anything wrong 
wrong but loved us and gave his life for us, but he died for us anyway. Friend, he kept his mouth closed and he took the punishment for sin and for sinners. Man, that's my Jesus. <laughs> Whoo, that's my Jesus. Oh, would you listen? Would you listen? He suffered. He suffered as an innocent man. 2 Corinthians 5.21 For He hath made Him to be sin for us who knew no sin, that we might be made the righteousness of God in Him. He knew no sin, and He suffered as an innocent man. Oh, would you look in Philippians chapter 2. And old Joseph, he went through all of this, and he went from the prison to the palace. And he suffered... And he went through things, but God blessed him anyway, and God put him above a kingdom to be the Savior of the Old Testament. That name's Aphnath Paneah. Y'all remember that name? That's what Pharaoh called him. That is a Hebrew term that has three meanings. It means the abundance of life. It means the revealer of secrets. And it also means the Savior of the world. Joseph became the Savior of the world. If you wanted your need met, you had to go to him. If you wanted to be filled and full, you had to go to Him. May I tell you, we're in the New Testament. Hello? Jesus is the Savior of the world. And I want you to know in Philippians chapter 2 and in verse 9. Philippians chapter 2 and in verse 9. Wherefore God also highly exalted Him and given Him a name which is above every name, that at the name of Jesus every knee should bow of things in heaven and things in earth and things under the earth, and that every tongue should confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. Joseph was loved by his father. He was stripped of his glory. He became a slave. He was a prosperous man. He overcame temptation. He was wrongly accused. He offered no defense. He suffered as an innocent man. And then by God's power and authority, was exalted as the Savior of the world. May I tell you today about a story about a man named Jesus who was loved by his Father, who was stripped of his glory, who became a slave, who was a prosperous man, who overcame temptation, who was wrongly accused, who offered no defense, who suffered as an innocent man, and by the power and the authority of an almighty God was highly exalted and lifted up above all people to become the Savior of the world. Amen. And as those Old Testament families needed help, may I tell you here in the New Testament day we need help. As those Old Testament people needed filling and they needed food and they needed water and they needed substance, may I tell you, we need substance today. We need to be filled. We need to be full. And God lifted up one man in that day and it was Joseph. If they were going to get what they needed, they had to go to Joseph. May I tell you, there's only one that's lifted up today and his name is Jesus Christ. If your family's going to be fed, if your family's going to be filled, if your family's going to be saved, we're going to have to go to the one that God highly exalted and lifted up above every single position, above every single person. May I tell you the stature and the position of Jesus is above all. As Joseph was above all, may I tell you, Jesus is above all. And if you're going to be saved, if you're going to be filled, if you're going to be full this morning, you must go to the one that has been highly exalted to be our Savior. May I tell you, our Savior is not Obama. Do you hear me? Democrats, do you hear me? Republicans, do you hear me? Religion, do you hear me? It is no man, it is no plan, it is no government, it is no party. It is a Savior in Jesus. He did not highly exalt the Democrat Party. He didn't highly exalt the Republican Party. He didn't highly exalt Obama. He didn't highly exalt Queen Elizabeth. He highly exalted Jesus. If you want substance, if you want to be saved, if you want your family to be saved, you got to go to Jesus. you got to go to Jesus. Oh, I'm so sick of Trump and Hillary Clinton. I'm so sick of that mess. We don't need Hillary. We don't need Trump. We need Jesus. We need Jesus. These Democrats get up. These Republicans get up. Well, we got a plan, friend. God offered a plan 2,000 years ago. It worked then and it's going to work today. There is one that is highly exalted above all. And friend, we got to go to him. We got to quit looking to mankind. We got to quit looking to religion. 
we got to quit looking at parties. And we got to go to the one that God highly exalted above all. <laughs> Pharaoh didn't have the power that Joseph had. Only Joseph had this power. You remember those brothers that rejected him? Those very brothers that rejected him was fixing to be fed by him. Isn't that awesome? Now you look at Joseph, and I had my brothers, and I had that second chance, and I was lifted up. Brother Russell, I, was going to be, I would be ugly to my brothers. <laughs> I guarantee you, I would get them back. I said, oh boy, look at here. Now who's up on high? That's not what he did, though. Oh, what a man. And those very people that rejected him said, here you go. Here's your substance. May I tell you, we've rejected Jesus. And the very ones that he rejected, that we rejected, the very ones that said, we don't want you, we don't like you, we don't need you. I want you to know he's there for us today. And he's offering everything that we need. He's highly exalted above all. Oh, what a Savior. I'm so sick. I'm so sick of hearing agendas, hearing all of this mess. Friend, we need Jesus. We have families dying. We have families perishing. And we want to spend our time pushing agendas. Friend, let's push a man. Let's push a God man. Let's push Jesus. And instead of getting our families to try to fit the mold of society or the mold of religion, let's take our families to Jesus. Jesus, we're hungry. We need to be fed. We're thirsty. We need to be filled. Oh, 13 years old, dying and going to hell, I realized there was only one that could save me. And that day there was only one that could save them. Friend, there's only one that could save us today. And his name is Jesus. If you're here this morning, you've never been saved. May I tell you there's a Savior. And his name is Jesus Christ. And he can save you from your sins. He can redeem you. He can forgive you. I've heard it over and over. I'm not good enough. He's not impressed by your works today. But he's impressed by the works of Jesus. He's not saving you on your merit. We get saved on the merit of Jesus. Listen, He's lifted up, but you got to go to Him. You got to go to Him. I look out upon our country, I look out upon our nation. We're messed up, people. We're confused. We're confused. Jesus is our only hope. He's the only one that can fix this. And it's going to start by daddies taking their families to Jesus. Come on, family, let's go. As for me and my house, we're going to serve the Lord. Oh, we need daddies that will look unto Jesus as the Savior of the home. May I tell you who the Savior of the home is? It's Jesus. You want your home to be saved? Go to Jesus. Let me tell you who the Savior of the church is. We don't have no board here. We don't have a committee that is above us who tells us what to do. Let me tell you who the Savior of the church is this morning. His name is Jesus. I don't answer to no board who tells me what to preach. I listen to Jesus. I'm that star that is held in His hand. Friend, He's the head of this church. He's above all. Oh man, I'm glad to be saved this morning. Man, I'm glad to know Jesus as my Savior. Friend, He's the Savior of the world. Would you make Him your personal Savior? Maybe you're having trouble in your home. Take you home to the Savior. Say, so, Lord, we need your help. Lord, we need your help. Would you stand very quiet, very reverent with me? These, these altars are going to be open. If you need help, come, fall upon these altars and ask the Lord for help. If you need to be saved, I'm going to ask you to come forward. If you're hungry... I want you to know there's somebody that can fill you today. There's someone that can make you full. I can't save you, but I know a man who can. Would you come to him today? Every head is bowed, every eye is closed. This invitation is open. I hadn't preached to you any, any big message, no fancy words, no fancy saying, but friend, it's the gospel message you've heard today. 
by faith cometh by hearing and hearing by the word of God. Would you place your faith in what's been said today? These altars are open. Would you take your families to the Savior? Come this morning. If you need to be saved, come right now. Don't put it off. Come right now. If you have a public decision, would you come right now? Jesus suffered for you. He offered no defense because of you and me. He died for us. Would you receive him as the Savior? She's going to continue to play. The invitation is extended. As the invitation was extended in that day, here's the Savior. If you want to be filled, come to Him. Friend, the invitation is given to us to come to the Savior of the world. It's here. Would you be saved? Oh, would you accept Him today?